Hello, everybody. I, Hello. in case you haven't seen me, because I don't talk much on these things, so I haven't been the big picture very often. Um, but I've been here every time, I promise. I am Sarah Morgan, and I am the associate pastor at Second Presbyterian Church. Um, Tim, our head of staff and fearless leader, uh, has tested positive for COVID. So he is under the weather and resting and recuperating, we hope. So I am here tonight uh, carrying out his vision for this last session um, in hopes that we can come up with some concrete plans and talk about what we've learned over the last six or eight weeks, however long it's been. So we'll start, we'll open with prayer and then we'll just dive right in. So let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have all had to gather across states and across congregations and across town. Uh, we thank you for the conversation and for your presence in it. And we ask that you would guide us as we go forward to make change in this troubled world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want us to start as a whole group. Um, and this is where that raise hand feature may come to come in handy so that it's not super chaotic. And I will try to do like Tim, if you can't figure out where the um, raise hand button is, I'll try to watch on the screen. You can raise your actual hand if you need to. Um, but I want us to start as a whole group talking about uh, what we've learned through this study. Uh, and this was in the email, so maybe you've been thinking about it a little bit um, in the last couple of days. But if you have something in particular that has jumped out to you that you've learned through this study, and in particular, what surprised you, and underneath that, what surprised you in a good way, what surprised you in a not so good way? Um, so we can just start, let's start with general thoughts about what, what have we learned through this study together. The peoples. Oh, you're muted. Hang on a minute. You got it. Sorry. There you go. Uh, this is Liz. When we started this study, I kept running into this word called woke. And I thought, what the Sam Hill is woke? <laughs> now that we have finished this study, I know what woke is, and I'm woke. And I scrutinize everything. I mean, TV shows, ads, news, everything from a different perspective. And I'm very glad to have that perspective. Okay, Carol. I, was, <coughs> I guess I was surprised and not surprised to find that there are <coughs> things that white people were afraid to say to black folks and that there were things that black folks were afraid to say to us and I was very um I have felt really good about this group coming together and being able to really talk about some things in a in a civil way that was really about discovering each other's perspective and that was very refreshing for me because it didn't feel like propaganda it didn't feel like we're, somebody was trying to sell their point of view it was like we were really I felt like it, it awoke an interest for me in finding out what is it that Black Americans and Native Americans and Asian Americans, what are they afraid to say to us? And what things am I afraid to say and find out? Great. Roger? Yeah, make sure I'm unmuted. Uh, you are. One thing I, I am is, uh, first off, is appreciative because in this season with uh, all the uh, change that we're going through, there's, there's what I call a conversation and then there's pseudo conversation. Pseudo conversation is where you're, you're hitting the talking points, but you can't really see a person's heart. I'm saying like for the, for the guest presenters and Tim, especially with people that are close to my life, like my sister, you, you, you get to see a person's heart by their watching their actions consistently. And even though this has only been like a six or eight week study, I, I believe 
he is really the, the heart of Christ. I'm not saying, I'm saying everybody is at different maturity levels. I know I'm, I'm an infant when it comes to that. Saying, you, you know, to have a, a really true conversation that impacts the heart, you got to start from, from, a, uh, from, a, from, a, from a right perspective. And I'm just mm -hmm. saying within at least the, um, the way this, in which this is organized, it seems like it's a very, it's a, it's a very healthy place to, to have, a, have the conversation. And if, you, if we get better at it, we got to continue it in such a way where we, where I think the word says you speak heart to heart and breast to breast. I did have a quick question about, uh, I guess last week's presenter, uh, I, I saw that he had a written response to some of the questions and I didn't know if those were handed out to, or sent out to the group. If they were, I, I would like you to copy of that if possible. I think they're on our website under Wednesday Night Bible Study. If you go to secondpres.org, 2ndpres.org, and there's a tab up at the top that says Wednesday Night Bible Study, and I'm pretty sure they're on there. I think all of okay. the handouts from the, from the lessons are on there. And if not, you okay. can email on, our on office me. administrator. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John Kerr. Or one of the curs. Yeah, it was me actually. Um, I enjoyed the first art, the first handout that you've given about white fragility. Um, I mean, I've heard that phrase, but I hadn't read anything about it. And it, it it just helps me understand why it is so hard for whites to consider themselves racist because of you know the old definitions that we used of racism and and looking at it from a perspective of white fragility and white privilege, it was something that I'd never thought about doing. And I thought that was really eye-opening. And um, uh, I wish we could get that, you know, I guess part of our role is to educate others about that perspective. So. Okay. So I go ahead. My hand is up. I uh, I share your thought. The term white privilege and white fragility, those were both new to me in a way, and it was very helpful to read that. It was very eye-opening, I thought. Peggy. I came into this um, thinking that I knew quite a bit about racism and, and its impact in our society. And what I learned was how little I know. Mm. Uh, you know we, we, I, and even now, I, I realize that uh, I'm just beginning to really understand the incredible depth of impact of racism, far beyond what I even thought I understood. So to me, it's, it's been a, an, 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 a Kind of an awakening, but also an understanding that there is so much more to learn and so much more to understand about each other. Anybody else have any general things that they've learned? If not, we'll move on. So we, oh, Harry, you've got one. No, hang on a minute. You're muted. Hello. I lost you. There. Am I there? There you are. Okay. Oh, oh he did it again. No. Oh, wait. You're muted again. <laughs> How's that? There you yeah. go. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um. I was going to say, I, I uh, ran across that white fragility, too, and it's kind of an eye-opener uh, to me, but the other thing that I had run across was white male privilege that I'd never really thought about, and, uh, and, and now have thought about it here for the last few weeks, that, that, that uh, as a 70-something-year-old white male, I've been extraordinarily privileged in life, a, a firstborn in my family, you know, so I had that to deal with as well, but I had taken some um, diversity training, diversity surveys and stuff like that where I used to work, where I retired and was um, 
uh, regularly chagrined to see that uh, I, I scored in the bias category. And so uh, this, it, it, there's still kind of an eye-opening process, I think, that still needs to continue. Thank you. Can you hear me, Sarah? Yes, Christina, go ahead. Um, I'll be right back. Oh, how sweet is that? Um, <laughs> Sorry. That in follow up with that, when I came into this, um, as said in our small group in the fit, late fifties and sixties, as a leader in the Presbyterian Youth Organization in Chicago, I was a part of standing up for my friends that were black on my board. And I, I thought I had an understanding. And the, the book, Fright, White Fragility, has been so powerful to read. And this experience of listening, especially to the, the presenters that we've had. Um, I went to the grocery store this week at eight in the morning just with us old folks. And I, I looked at that receipt and I realized that they might, I might have gotten by with taking out at one item and no receipt. And it, it's like it's put, uh, it's opened a curtain that I thought I had opened and I thought I had studied and I've been a part of protests and a strong believer in hiring diverse um, staff, but this has been at a deeper level. And I think what it takes is for the courage of each of us, those of us that are white and those of us that bring a background of being African-American, black, um, whatever is the correct term and being willing to be, realize that sometimes I'm gonna make mistakes in what I say and how I say it. And I don't want to be offensive, but having people that are willing to say that term is offensive to us. And let me explain why and educate each other. This education in this program has just been with the material and the, the individual discussion has been phenomenal. And I am very grateful for it. And I want to continue to extend uh, this process to the other members our congregation and our community. Thank you. Christina, you made me realize that I said that I would look for actual hands raised and I haven't done that. So I'm going through now to see if anybody is raising their actual hand. Okay. Well, we've touched on this a little bit in, um, in these comments. Um, but was there anything that surprised you um, for the good or the bad? Anything that surprised you in a good way or in a not so good way? Anybody? The curves again? Oh, wait a minute, you're muted, Diane. There, is that okay? Yep. Um, I think, I can't remember which session it was, but it went, talked about the history of race. It might've been one of the history of racism in the United States. Um, and the, uh, about the GI Bill and how it wasn't available to African-Americans uh, who, who came out of the service. And then the beginnings of, uh, of how public housing, how, or how communities of color became so segregated because of the areas that they lived and, um, and how our policies just perpetuated that and still do to this day. That was, I, I didn't know the history of those things and why um, it's been so hard um, for African Americans or for blacks to, to get the educations and to, uh, to live in, in, decent neighborhoods where, where crime is, is not a constant everyday worry. And, um, so that really disturbs me um, to, I mean, I, I've known those 
I've, I've seen the outcomes of, of that policy, but didn't know what the origins of it were. Okay, Carol. Well, I, I think the story about having to have a receipt, um, I may have mm -hmm. known that on a shallow level, but th it, it has stuck with me and it's something that I keep coming back to and thinking about in my spare time. And I think that was something, uh, the repercussions and the ramifications of that have surprised me as I keep thinking about it. Um, and then um, in my small Bible study in our church group, a friend of mine told a story from just this week about how she was riding in traffic with an African-American man on a motorcycle and another car and herself and as they turned off uh, onto Chapman Highway, a policeman came up behind them and pulled over the black motorcycle driver. And she said, he had done nothing that we haven't done. The other three cars that were in our group, he, had not spe he was not speeding. He used his turn signal. He had done nothing. And yet the police chose him to pull over and stop. And she said, now later I saw that he had pulled up behind us. So obviously they had let him go. But she even called uh, the police department in Blunt County and said, I, hey, I saw this and it, and it bothers me and I'm not calling any names and I'm not saying who it was because I don't know, but this is something, you know, that happened that we need to be aware of. And uh, that particular person that she got hold of was very dismissive right. and just said, oh, you know, just brushed her off and said, well, you know, thanks for calling. Uh, and I think that brought like a renewed um, awareness for uh, the other folks in my small Bible study. And it was a jumping off point for us to talk about things that we, that I've learned here. So mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Clara Harden. Uh, yes, ma'am. I was yeah. really surprised and, and shocked by something that uh, Dr. Flagg shared with us in uh, one of our breakout rooms dealing with healthcare. Uh, she told about her pregnant daughter going to her doctor asking for a flu shot, and he declined to give her one with the comment that you look healthy. <gasps> she later <clears throat> took the flu, and I don't know whether this was a cause or not, but anyway, uh, she lost her baby. Oh, and I am actually absolutely shocked that there is a doctor with a license to practice who will decline and keep treatment away from someone who has come for treatment. All right, Margaret Massey Cox. One of the things that I have known that there was a disparity between wealth accumulations from whites to blacks for a long, long time. But the numbers, the, the raw numbers that were presented in this program are, uh, are mind boggling and, and, and angering. Their accumulation of all of the things that we've talked about and what's happened out of all these years that have prevented this group of God's people of coming to the table and being able to participate 100%. It's it's maddening. Mm. Amen. All right, Bev. Okay. All right, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. It was like, it put in a thing that said you're spotlighting as I went to unmute. I was like, I don't know what to hit. So. <laughs> Sorry, that was my uh, bad. No, it's great. Thanks. So I think one of the things that hit me the most and continues to be a chewing point for me, I guess surprised is the word, is the educational aspects of, you know, what we've been taught in schools um, from a very young age that may not be, no, isn't full truths. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I shared, you know, that we were talking about when was the first time that you had a person of color as an educator. And for me, it was college. And, you know, I, I came from a very small town, but I think that thinking that through for our children and then 
I was um, honored to have lunch with Jackie um, last week, I think. I'm like, what today is it? Last week. Um, and we kind of talked through that about like choices and how to do things better for the future generation. And I've just kind of been chewing on that of what that looks like. Um, as some of us do have the opportunity to teach our children from home, you know, integrating things that wouldn't have been taught otherwise. And just, I mean, flat out racist things such as like in the kindergarten classes, it's just like a given that you do the Pilgrims and Indians program kind of stuff, or, you know, slavery's glossed <laughs> over um, when talking about educational systems, you know, it, it's very much what leaning, things like that, that we can do better and, and teach our children better, so. Thank you. All right, Catherine Freeman. Uh, my comment has to do with what Clara said, and it is a thought that when we begin to talk about things that we might do, I want to bring this up, and I can either do it now, or is it at the end of the session we will talk about ideas of what we might do? We're going to break up into smaller groups and talk about action steps and then come back together and, and talk about okay. it, too. All right, if anybody else has anything to add about surprises... I want to make sure we have time to get to our smaller groups. All right, I don't see any. Oh, I do see hands. Kim. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that um, this has been a time of uh, self-reflection. Um, not only for me, but you know, a lot of times I'll admit my my siblings and we get a chance to chat. Um, you know, what did you think about the session? This is after the session. And so it's allowed us to kind of reflect even on our own family um, and, and be comfortable saying that we're uncomfortable with the term white privilege. We know more about black privilege. Um, and um, I guess just that, it, it's really made me grateful, I guess, for my parents, my grandparents, my upbringing, because we were truly taught that Christ created, we were all created in the image of God. My father pushed that a lot, um, and that God created male and female, and he didn't talk about, you know, white or black, but that was just promoted in our home. And it just, I think, made us um, comfortable with the discussion of race. And uh, I'm grateful for that. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Okay, Marty. Uh, yeah, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, uh, number one, uh, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned before, we, we have a child with special needs. And so we get bits and pieces of it. Uh, and, like, uh, and I don't think people are are aware sometimes of, of, of offensive language or statements. Like uh, there, there was somebody I know who's retired and he always calls himself, well, I'm retarded. Well, that's a very offensive term to someone who has a child with special needs. And uh, I, I've let that pass by and uh, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And uh, uh, you know, I, uh, and, um, the other thing is I, I had a long conversation with a, with a good friend of mine uh, by the name of John Mayo, and 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 John's in the Episcopal Church, and, and and very active in it. And he's a graduate of Howard. So I called him today and said, "Well, what do you think about your, you know, your schoolmate being uh, selected to be a, a vice presidential candidate?" She was my preference, and uh, and I was happy with that, but. The joy that I heard from that man about uh, a woman of color being selected, it made me realize how often our black brothers and sisters haven't been invited to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, one of the things I asked him, I said, John, what do you think we should do? 
and, um, and we're going to get to that. I know in a small group, and uh, but he said, "How about supporting not full college? That's a Presbyterian uh, school," and it never crossed my mind that that's something we should do. But I've been thinking about that now and say, "Why? Why have we rich white Presbyterians have not supported a predominantly black Presbyterian college?" I didn't know. Great question. I didn't know it was a Presbyterian college either. That's yes. Good to know. Yes. Okay. Um, well, let's move into small groups, uh, into breakout groups, because I want us to have time to talk about these things, about our action steps from here. Uh, so as I break you up into groups, um, I want you to talk about what we can push our or encourage our congregations to do on this front? What have you been thinking about that might be good congregational actions to take? And then also, um, what steps will you, do you plan to take as an individual? So you're looking at it from a congregational perspective and from an individual perspective. What action steps are you taking from, from here? Okay. I'm going to try my hand at, at putting people in breakout rooms, so we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I hope that everybody's time was um, fruitful. And let's start with, um, with congregational action steps. So what did your groups talk about as far as what we can urge our congregations to do? And we'll do the hand raising thing again, and hopefully Robert's not going to share my screen with everybody. We talk about using this format for a Sunday school class. Oh. Just in general, raising awareness because a lot of folks think that yeah. it's not a problem anymore. I mean, we've done, we've come so far, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think we have. And I think that if you scratch the surface, you're going to get a lot of raw, a, a lot of raw emotion from everyone. Yeah. Okay, Peggy. We talked about something kind of similar. We we talked about having some kind of group activity in the church, and one of the things we talked about was um, bringing together whoever wanted to participate in a, in a kind of book group to read the book white fragility we thought that would be a great oh, point yeah. um and have a discussion about that um one person had heard from someone else either in this group or in some other setting uh, the idea of, of working with a primarily black church and sort of doing a swap of a representative group from one church going to the other and vice versa. Um, as we went on in the conversation, we began to think that that probably wasn't where you wanted to start. That, you know, that, that was a little too, we have something wonderful to offer and you know, don't you want us to come and uh, participate in your church, but that we needed to form relationships first. And, and it was forming those relationships that was going to be the challenge, but also the critical first step for anything we did. Okay, Dana. Um, yeah, we talked about the swapping idea too. Um, swapping uh, pastors for a Sunday um swapping Sunday school teachers or or uh, choirs uh doing um mission activities with a predominantly uh black church in order to get to know people and um not in this you know try to get beyond the surface and do things where we can really develop uh relationships mm -hmm. That's all I had to share. <laughs> Sorry, too many buttons on the host side. <laughs> okay, the peoples. Um, I, I really think our church needs to start with a church-wide study of Be the Bridge by Latasha Morrison. I've given one to uh, Sarah, and I took one to, to Jackie. Uh, 
but I, I think it's a good way for our church to try to pull in the rest of the congregation into being woke also. Mm -hmm. it, we, you know, we just had a handful from our church that did this study, and that's good, and that's a good place to start. But we need to go on beyond that. We need to get more congregants on board. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that book is uh, a good way to start. Yeah, I think most of our conversation revolved around that, the idea of getting others in our in our own congregation. I, I'm at Lake Hills and we had Fountain City and Second Press in our group and we all agreed that we needed to um, go back to our churches and engage people, mm -hmm. uh, our, our fellow parishioners, and, and then see what happens. Hey, any other congregational action items? You can, oh, Bruce has got one. Oh, wait a minute, Bruce, you're muted. Unmute. Unmute, Bruce. There we go. He's working on it. There you go. Uh, we talked a good bit about a collaborative effort between our church and in this the, uh, particular church we talked about was Shallow Presbyterian which Kim described as having a fairly small attendance. And so it, it seemed like a, to me, a, a, a fruitful possibility to combine small groups uh, for either worship or for a, a fellowship night or something of that sort. Um, um, it, it's not, that's not a, an original idea particularly, but it, it I think it, uh, given the, how much we talked about this subject, that it would have a, mm -hmm. uh, a real possibility of uh, success. Thank you. All right, any other congregational actions? Making sure we don't have any other hands. Thank you. Okay, what did your groups talk about as far as individual action steps? Peggy? The, um, one of the things we talked about is when you're in a situation with someone who's very different from you and you're alone, like uh, one, of the, one of the members talked about being um, in an elevator door and the door opened and she was a, a female and, and a, a very large black man was on the elevator and that her initial response was to feel some degree of fear and she said you know there wasn't there really wasn't any reason for me <laughs> to be afraid but so I need to pay attention to those things that trigger emotions in us um, and kind of you know Start with a smile instead. You know, trying not to to uh, to react in fear or disgust or or any, but to approach that person as you would you know anyone else and start with a smile because a smile goes a long way to begin a relationship. And you know, you may not be best friends with the person you just met on the street who's covered in tattoos, but you're <laughs> treating them as another human being who has value. And that that's where we all need to start, uh, is to value each other and value everyone. We also that starting with a smile <laughs> thing is so difficult in the age of mask wearing. Yes, yeah, well, we all agree that you can smile with your eyes. You can. <laughs> Definitely. You have to smile really big so that your eyes show. Yeah. <laughs> but it is possible. <laughs> it is. It is. All right, the peoples. Uh, Catherine Freeman brought up an interesting idea uh, along the lines of uh, connecting with young pregnant black women that are kind of fearful of going to the doctor by themselves and to go as a mentor, accompany them to a doctor's office as a mentor and as, as somebody that would uh, give them Maybe maybe help them with that fear. An advocate. 
Yeah. I thought that was a good idea. Yeah. Okay, Catherine Freeman. Oh, wait a minute, you're muted. There. I've read that these young black women feel dismissed by the doctor. Mm -hmm. I have never been dismissed by a doctor. And I feel, you know, I'd like to go with someone and just be their friend and let the doctor know. I don't want the doctor to be offended by my being there, but just let them know that I'm a friend. I want to help her with things that she will encounter or whatever you would say. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that might work? Maybe. Someone who's, who's kind of a navigator. Uh, yeah. You know, helping. Yeah. Like an advocate, right. An advocate, yeah. Thinking in the term ombudsman, but that's not quite it. But mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think that's something that I could do, except in the time of pandemic, I'm totally right. isolating myself, so it's not a very good time. Going in and out of I doctor's offices go. right now is not great. <laughs> And the other thing that I would like to mention to the group is Roger there, Roger. Uh, he mentioned something last time about when young black men particularly so often get arrested and then they don't know the process, the legal process that needs to get them out of this situation. I don't remember, there's a term that he used. I don't remember it, um, but I'm just thinking we have lawyers in our church that could just walk them through the process, maybe. Mm. I feel that that's something that we that we could do as individuals. All right. Any other individual ideas? <clears throat> Coming up, or we're, we're we've closed in on our time, but I don't want to cut anybody off if there are some other ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, I thought one was uh, one that came up out of our group. It wasn't my idea, but I, I forgot who expressed it. But they talked about possibly if uh, Minister Tim gets better or, or a group of uh, people that participate in the meeting from a leadership perspective where to hold maybe like a, an interactive or maybe even a Zoom service to where you can invite, you know, people to kind of watch it and do something like a little bit like what we're doing. You know, you know, I don't really know what the construct that would be, but that's something that would, uh, you know, uh, I think would be appealing, especially if, you know, I don't know if I'm talking like, you know, three or four people in my area and say, hey, you know, it may be not a formal service, but hey, just, hey, here's the link, let's watch this together. And then we turn around and we have conversations about it because, uh, yeah. the, you know, the guests that I've heard over the summer have been nothing short of excellent. Yeah. I can't remember who suggested it, but it, I know it wasn't me. So, but it was, it was a great idea. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Great. great. Someone in our group, it wasn't me. Uh, can I, I don't know if anyone can hear me. Is anyone? Yep, yeah. we can hear you. Um, suggested, you know, as individuals, just forming, get yourself involved in some sort of a diverse group uh, on a regular basis so that you can form individual relationships with people different from you and and be consistent with that. I thought that was a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carol? I was just going to piggyback on what she was saying, that it sounds like a lot of the things that we boil, of all the suggestions we've made, it boils down to working at making personal relationships. Uh, and however you do that, whether it's through lunch or through worship or through church or being nice to the person in the grocery store, uh, not taking that for granted, but working yeah. to make sure that you have diverse relationships in your world. You know, one of the things that that... Uh... And one lady in our group mentioned something called the Unique Academy. There is a man here in Knoxville who is mentoring young men. And if there's something, if this might appeal to you, you might want to get involved in this. I'm sure they could help use help financially, but she said there's a website and it's spelled U-U-N-I-K. And what, what he's doing is showing these young men how to Zoom and stuff about society that's going to make their lives a little bit easier. So I thought that that was kind of a, a terrific idea. 
Can I jump in? I was the young lady who, who mentioned it. Hi, no, young lady. Hi there. Um, it's U-U-N-I-K uh, Academy, all one word, mm -hmm. dot O-R-G. And it's a, a non-for-profit organization right here in Knoxville. Um, he takes kids from um, uh, K, K through fifth grade. And he also takes kids through age um, 13 or 14, I think is his cutoff. And he mentors them, education, uh, social, uh, STEM. Uh, they take field trips where before COVID hit um, to different things, museums. Sounds terrific. Um, yeah. it, but the big thing is, is his motto is that if we can get uh, educational foundation with our young boys, then the choices that they make when they get older are going to be uh, less choices of getting in trouble, et cetera. So he's really big on education, but UUNIKacademy.org. Um, the website is wonderful. And um, yes, we would love your support, definitely. We're actually um, in the process of um, buying a building out in the Lonsdale area. And so um, we're getting ready to launch a, a campaign to raise money to be able to do that. So, but we want more than your money. We would love <laughs> for your participation as well. So, yes. And he does ACT preps. Um, he holds ACT prep classes. Uh, for um, seventh graders through the 11th grade. Um, it's just a wonderful program. My son went through it. My Both of my grandsons are in it now. It's just wonderful. So sorry to interrupt. No, that's not interrupting. That's wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Kurz. Oh, uh, I guess I put my hand up. Uh, <laughs> I've, um, I've been trying to think about ways to get youth together and build relationships with, uh, with youth. Uh, and uh, I talked with our fine director at our ch church camp, the uh, Camp John Knox Bree, mm -hmm. and asked if there would be any possibility if, if we could uh, uh, sponsor a big group of kids. And, and I've also contacted Emerald Youth Foundation that takes, uh, does a wonderful job with inner city kids, have them participate with our kids at, the, at a summer camp next year mm -hmm. and um, Bree was very supportive of that and again I've already contacted Emerald and I'm hoping to get a call back from a girl named Erin Wright at uh, Emerald and if anybody knows her but uh, I'd love to, to speak to her because I think that's I think youth is a good place to start to try to build relationships mm -hmm. that they you know become friends at, at a young age and they and they uh, it can it can help help a lot yep. so uh, I'm working on that. We'll see what happens. Great. All right, the peoples. Uh, this is a message from Jim Ford, who could not uh, participate tonight, but he would like our church to have another follow-up meeting. And he encouraged those of you from other churches to have another follow-up meeting with, with your church members to uh, kind of get some concrete ideas going. And so I told him I would pass that on. Thanks. Uh, uh -oh. Kim, I saw your hand and I lowered it before I spotlighted you. There you are. Okay, Kim. Now, um, I was just thinking that Tim might be willing to share names and addresses or names and phone numbers or maybe just email addresses of the participants and that might be a start of kind of getting to know because i don't think oh. everybody goes to the same church no. um, yeah. but that might be a, a a good way to stay in touch and you know if somebody if, if someone ever had a question or something, or, you know, can you, how does this sound? Does this sound appropriate? Would this be offensive? I'd be more than glad to, to chat. Um, I also just wanted to follow up with the Unique Academy. It is a phenomenal program. That program uh, was held at Shiloh for many years. Really? For many years. 
works. And yeah. so I'm glad to see it continuing to move forward. Another a, a group that I saw as a school administrator that always could use support was Boys and Girls Club. Yeah. Um, a lot yeah. of kids there, a yeah. lot. And um, needy kids as well. Yeah. yeah. That's all. True. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll let Kim have the last word unless anybody's got a... Um, got something that they're just dying to say but we send our contact information to you sarah well so it, everybody's email addresses um we have but i also want to respect anyone that doesn't want their contact information sent out um so uh, we might need to think through how to do that yeah. um uh, mr sarah yep. i do want i do as an outsider of Knoxville community, I just want to say a special thank you to uh, uh, Pastor Tim and yes. and uh, um, the team at Second and anyone organizational impact, including yourself. You said you were in the background. I don't want you to walk away without hearing the words "thank you" from me because you didn't have to do it, but you chose to. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Thank you to all of you that showed up and continue to show up. This has been a wonderful conversation, and I know I've benefited from it, and um, I hope that you all um, feel the same, uh, that it has been a wonderful opportunity of growing and learning. So uh, we are grateful for everybody that has shown up. And we'll work on a way to share contact info um, that allows people who maybe don't want their contact info shared to bow out. Mary Farmer, you've got your hand up. You're muted. One thing we want to consider doing in response to that um, request to share our information is that as a church, we might have quarterly or something, a meal on a Sunday night or some night to bring those interested Close. together. Oh, yeah, and to just interact and get to know each other rather than through this crazy screen. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody that knows me knows I love an excuse to get together over a meal. So I'm all for that. I hope that we will be able to do that at some point in the not so distant future. Mary's move though. <laughs> all right, any other comments to close us out? Otherwise, I will say thank you all so much for being here. And I hope that our paths will cross again as we take our action steps from this point. I hope that this is not the end. Thank Amen. you all so much for being thank here. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Thank you everybody. Good Bless you. Stay safe and healthy. There you go.